Okay, so um, I'm here to talk about MIST lift. So, like Paul said, um, it's not a sexy technique. Um, and then, you know, in full disclosure, I actually did a prone lateral yesterday in an MIST lift. So, um, I'm not just a MIST lift person. So, what we'll discuss are surgical pearls uh, as well as the limitations of the MIST lift. Um, now, just um, a background of the technique. Uh, what we're looking at is the approach uh, through the foramen to do deliver an interbody fusion. Uh, but in reality, I like to say that this should be called a, the transcambin triangle lumbar interbody fusion. And really, the, the key component of uh, refining your T lift technique is to really understand Cambin's triangle and, and how you can access the disc space. Um, here's a, a great paper uh, that was published in JNS Spine uh, by uh, Mike Wang and Lutumi Allen and Andrew Fanus. Um, and they, they described in detail the relevant anatomy of the uh, Kamen's triangle uh, for T lift. Um, so, if you've been to any sort of MIS T lift course, uh, you typically think of the triangle with the three borders the medial border being the traversing root or the lateral thecal sac, the lateral border being the exiting nerve root, and the inferior border being the superior end plate uh, of the vertebral body below. Uh, but when you look at Kamen's original paper when he described this corridor, there's a fourth surface here, which is actually the superior articular, uh, articular process uh, of the facet. And, uh, you know, in, in most t lift uh, techniques, uh, the, the SAP is gone uh, as part of your removal. So, um, you know, understanding the relationship of uh, the, this fourth uh, surface, um, you know, you, you, it becomes more of, instead of a uh, two-dimensional uh, corridor, it becomes a three-dimensional corridor. And so when we think of the traditional MIST lift, uh, this involves an extended uh, removal of the SAP, uh, some removal of the IAP, and then maybe the lamina and pars. And here you can get a great direct decompression, the exiting nerve root, as well as the thecal sac. Um, there are some variations where that exist where you can leave the lamina and pars intact. And um, uh, also uh, this is relevant for when you're talking about doing endoscopic T lift as well. But this is the, the traditional MIST lift that uh, most people tend to think about. So as far as for uh, versatility, um, you know, it, it, for a lot of surgeons still, uh, even though it's an older technique, it's the default MIS approach. Uh, reason being there's few contraindications. It's really a war coaster approach for most degenerative uh, pathologies. Uh, I also like to call it the original single position surgery. Um, and, you know, um, you're going to hear a lot of um, great uh, technique talks about other approaches, but uh, which, you know, I tend to utilize when, when relevant, but um, there are still some cases where uh, the T lift is actually a preferred approach uh, as opposed to say an A lift or a lateral or, or um, anti SOS approach. Uh, a couple of examples that, uh, and these are all relative, I guess, uh, you know, L5S1 A, uh, a lift for, for male patients, especially younger male patients, um, uh, you know, the risk of retrograde ejaculation after surgery. Um, and also in certain uh, instances with the L4-5 with a, either a hyaluric crest, the transitional anatomy that was alluded to earlier, um, and where the, the plexus is basically pooled anterior. So, you know, these are still cases where, um, you know, even if uh, it, it might be useful to be, to be proficient at a TILA. Um, so here's a, a case from uh, my practice. So a uh, 60-year-old female who had a prior L3 to 5 uh, laminectomy had new onset of symptoms. Um, she actually progressed in the degree of spondylolisthesis and spondylosis, um, failed some conservative management. Uh, and so this is a case that uh, we addressed with the TLIF. So, um, you know, at least for me and my hands, um, the, the axial view here, you can see how the psoas is pulled anterior. So this is one where I'm reluctant to do a lateral approach. Uh, even though it'd be nice because you're, you, you know, you don't have to go through the previous incision. Uh, but, you know, with the, uh, how lateral you approach the T-lift, uh, even if someone's had a midline laminectomy, uh, you can avoid the scar and you're really working through virgin territory. So you don't have to deal with some of the epidural scarring uh, to access the disc. Uh, and then here's the, the radiographic result uh, in the end. So again, maybe uh, not as sexy of a picture as you'll see from the other, uh, my esteemed uh, co-faculty here, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the patient did well, it's still a minimally invasive approach, you know, that will go home the day, next day after surgery. Uh, maybe you can do this in a surgery center and a select, select patients. Um, and the end result is a uh, patient did well as far as for her, um, you know, original complaints and her symptoms. 
Um, so as far as how we can improve the, the T-lift technique, so th these are the pearls that I would offer. Uh, one is to consider a limited removal of the SAP. Um, so we've seen a lot of success from direct de decompressions with the laterals and things like that. And you can actually achieve the same effect with a T-lift. So not every T-lift case needs a direct decompression. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and then second, in, in particular for a minimally invasive approach is incorporating expandable cages. Um, and here, what we're trying to do is maximize the inner body reconstruction through a limited uh, working channel. Uh, and then finally, um, just as an aside, uh, integrating some newer technologies such as robotics and image guidance for your pedicle screw placement. Uh, really, the idea here is to streamline the other aspects of the procedure um, so that you can focus most of your attention on your T-lift. Um, so if, if you have things where the um, uh, techniques where the, the screw placement becomes, uh, you know, you know, relatively trivial, then uh, you can focus on uh, just one specific part of the technique and that can help with uh, your workflow. Um, here's a paper, technique paper. This is from Operative Neurosurgery. Uh, this is actually a two-part paper uh, by uh, Zach Ray uh, out of WashU. And he described a limited trans facet uh, inner, uh, MIST lift. Um, so this is something that, uh, that I do similar, but the idea here is that you, you have a limited removal of the IEP and you remove just enough SAP to have a working channel for your cage. Um, so obviously this is a little bit more of an advanced technique. Uh, and you can see here on the figure um, on the panel A, you can see where the traversing route would be. You can see the working corridors, the rectangle. So basically to fit the dimensions of your cage uh, and you're, you're still preserving some of the bony anatomy with the IAP and the SAP. Um, so the nerve roots are protected by the bony anatomy and really, um, you know, these are ideally suited for those cases where you don't need direct decompression. Um, and you, you can just, uh, you know, for instance, with the spondylolisthesis, where you just need to reduce the spondy, uh, provide a little bit of inner body reconstruction, and then that's all the patient really needs. Um, as an added thing, if, if, uh, if you've become facile at this technique, uh, in the cases where you do a direct decompression, um, you can actually take this approach first, do all of your inner body work, place your cage. Because when you think about what's really, uh, what, why do people not like MIST lifts? Uh, because they don't like the nerve root hanging there. They don't like having to put instruments in and out of the disc space. So if you can uh, utilize a limited technique like this where your neuro, uh, uh, relevant neural anatomy is protected, uh, put your cage in, put all your dangerous instruments in, be done with that part, and then go back and then do your direct decompression. That's, uh, I, I feel like that's a safer way to go and you probably minimize your risk of uh, deuteronomies and things like that and, and uh, nerve root injury. Um, so the second point talking about uh, incorporating expandable cages. Um, so there's, uh, I would say there's two sub variations. There's the bulleted cages. So this is the familiar um, kind of approach that um, pretty much everyone's familiar with. Um, and these have gone through several design iterations uh, over the years. And, uh, a lot of modern designs, they, they go on fairly low profile and they'll, they'll die and, and they'll have uh, uh, lordosis that you can increase up to 20 degrees in certain, some designs. Um, most of these have some sort of option to backfill the cage. So, uh, so once you've expanded the cage from a collapsed position, you can put graft in uh, afterward. Uh, and then the advantage of this uh, type of design is, is fairly straightforward. You just take advantage of your uh, trajectory where you're aiming across the midline to place your disc, um, more or less in the disc space. Um, disadvantage here is that you have a higher potential of subsidence. Uh, part of that is probably because, you know, where you're putting the cage is along uh, the channel of your disc prep. So if you're using paddle shavers and things like that, uh, despite being careful, um, like most of us are, uh, you can still get some bony violations and that might get exacerbated when you expand the cage uh, um, uh, after you insert it. Um, and then as far as for other uh, expandable designs, banana cages here. Um, so these include an articulating mechanism uh, that allow you to place the cage anteriorly along the popliteal ring. Uh, so you can take advantage of some of the denser uh, bone uh, along the end plate. Um, again, you also have options to backfill the cage after fully expand, uh, full expansion. Uh, and then since the, the cage is placed relatively anteriorly, if uh, the anatomy allows and you have significant uh, or sufficient anterior to posterior uh, spacing, you can actually stuff a lot of graft behind your cage. Um, and then that's a great, um, that's a great uh, area where you can get some good arthrodesis. Uh, the other advantage is that since you're turning these cages, you can have a longer footprint. Uh, so something like this, you can come into up to a 36 millimeter footprint. 
uh, which, uh, you know, compared to a traditional T lift cage, uh, you know, you're not quite in lateral cage uh, territory, but you're getting closer. Uh, the disadvantage of this is there's an additional learning curve. So there's more disc prep involved. There's a little bit of nuance in terms of maneuvering this uh, because essentially you're, you're relying on the anterior annulus uh, to be intact, to be able to slide uh, the banana cage to, to orient it. But uh, I think in a lot of cases, once you take the time to um, become facile at this technique, it's a, it's a fairly powerful thing that you can have in your arsenal. And again, uh, part two of, uh, of Dr. Ray's paper, they looked at their experience using this particular cage. And um, here you had uh, about 68 cases uh, where you saw on average radio, uh, with this radiographic outcome, seven millimeters of increased disc height, which is pretty good for a T-lift, uh, 2.8 millimeters of increased foraminal height. So the direct in, uh, decompression that we uh, talked about earlier. Uh, and he got almost seven degrees of segmental lordosis, which is fairly significant. If you look at some of the traditional T-lift, especially MIS T-lift data, uh, you know, traditional MIS T-lift is actually a kyphosing procedure. So the fact that he was able to get, um, you know, over six degrees segmentally was, was fairly significant. Um, uh, he did observe some subsidence. Um, it wasn't clear if, uh, there, I think there were a few cases in this where they had to go back and reoperate. So uh, like any technique, there, there are some drawbacks. So, uh, you know, as Dr. Pimenta uh, pointed out, sometimes you're trading complications in, in these different techniques. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, uh, you can also use MIT, uh, MIST lift for uh, deformity as well if you're trying to do uh, a mini open or less less uh, invasive deformity. So uh, Mike Wang published this paper back in 2013 uh, describing um, a, a mini open technique for improved sagittal balance with uh, a, what was a mini open uh, T lift technique. Um, so what he does, uh, or what he described in this paper was uh, basically just exposing half uh, unilaterally uh, multiple facets. So if you're going to do three or four inner bodies, you would just expose on the one side. And then you do your facetectomies, uh, and then you access your disc space, and you're able to place a lot of cages. Uh, and then the rest of the screws you can place percutaneously, um, you know, either through uh, separate stab incisions, or if you want to do a midline incision and go above the fascia, that's what I tend to do. Uh, as well as Mike, um, you know, there's some options there. And so uh, the approach here, um, you know, th this is a case where, you know, I, I think, you know, probably a mild uh, deformity for most folks here, um, where you can see this is primarily degenerative deformity. Um, she's got a fractional curve there on the left. Uh, so to approach this, uh, typically you would approach from the concavity of your fractional curve as far as for where you're gonna approach your T-lifts from. Uh, and then she does have some sagittal imbalance here. She has both, both pelvic uh, uh, pelvic lumbar mismatch as well as um, positive sagittal balance. Um, and then this is the result maybe two years afterwards. So you can see uh, I use the banana cages, uh, again, coming from the left side to correct that fractional curve. Uh, and then you use uh, the screws that basically correct coronally as well. Uh, probably nowadays, uh, I would do a little kickstand as well uh, on the left side just to, to get that uh, coronal balance just right. But again, you know, this is, you know, for a lot of people, this is your, your entryway into um, some of the MIS deformity that, that uh, we all strive for. Uh, and then also for, uh, you know, we've done this in thoracic cases as well. So here's an example of a 42 year old male. Uh, he had uh, back pain, but also was developing some uh, thoracic myelopathy. Uh, the MRI here, he shows that he's got a disc herniation. It's uh, more towards the right side. And on the sagittal MRI, um, he's got a little bit of a uh, listhesis. Uh, apologize, he, he also had an x-ray that showed this a little bit more. Um, so, I, you know, I wasn't comfortable with just doing a, a discectomy um, on him. Uh, I felt that he, he might, he probably needed some additional stabilization. And so this is a case where I did a thoracic uh, transfernal interbody fusion. You're basically utilizing the same corridor. You're going lateral to the fecal sac, so there's no uh, no worry about uh, retracting the cord here. Um, and here, I just use this uh, straightforward bulleted cage uh, to get the the, the integrity reconstruction. And you can see in the post-op films, um, this is about a, uh, two years out now that that, that the spinal thesis is reduced there, and and, and neuro, uh, neurologically he improved back to normal. So I'd like to close with some limitations of the MIST lift. Um, so, uh, you know, the, you know, despite the advances in technology, our cage footprint is still limited by the transfernal corridor, and there's really um, not a whole lot we can get around that. So, 
Um, you know, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Nan alluded to, if you're looking for a lot of sagittal uh, correction, especially at L5S1, uh, your ALIF is still your best bet. Uh, and then the segmental sagittal correction is somewhat limited through a true MISC lift approach. Uh, now, you can also take advantage of some posterior osteotomies where uh, you basically use your cage as a fulcrum, uh, but then, uh, you know, the, these techniques become less minimally invasive. Uh, and, and it's applicable in the majority of degenerative pathologies, but there are a few situations that are best avoided. So morbidly obese patients, you know, I practice in Michigan. So someone shows up with that MRI, but then you see uh, just scrolling through their films. This is a scout from an abdominal CT. Um, you know, she had a BMI over 50. Uh, but we're still able to get it done. So it's not something I recommend to do on a daily basis. But I, and I think, you know, any approach here is going to be difficult. So, you know, for me, I kind of stick with my default just to, to get the case done here. Uh, other situations to avoid uh, severe disc collapse. It's doable, but an osteotomy may be necessary. Um, for someone who's not so facile uh, at doing MIST lift, uh, you know, you might look to other approaches. Uh, this particular patient actually had unfavorable psoas anatomy, so I was forced to do an MIST lift. Uh, and then doing a dome osteotomy through a tube, uh, um, you know, it's definitely more, a little bit more of an advanced technique. Uh, and then there's some cases where you have severe coronal deformity where Kamen strain is essentially obliterated uh, and you don't really have a safe approach. Uh, the nerve, the your exiting nerve root is draped over the disc. So that's not, uh, that's not a case where you would do a T lift. Uh, so in summary, you know, understanding Kamen's prism, I think that's the key to the mastering the technique. Uh, there's a wide range of applications for most pathologies with the MIS T lift. And really there's few, if any, relative contraindications to the MIS T lift approach. Um, so I, I would argue it's still a great uh, tool to have in your bag um, as an MIS surgeon. Uh, thank you for your attention. Great, Vic. Uh, that was a, a great talk, and the MIST lift. True, uh, real workhorse uh, for neurosurgery uh, and orthopedic spine surgery as well. Um, you know, I, I, I think, it, as you said, be applied to almost any degenerative condition, actually. And there's so many variations on the theme. And uh, you point out Zach Ray's uh, variation, and that's just one of many. And I, I think it's one interesting viewpoint because he's minimizing. Uh, the bony resection, and he is dependent on uh, expandable cage technology because he's really going for indirect decompression everywhere and not so much direct decompression. And uh, um, I, I think that goes to where, you know, uh, surgeons are applying technology to solve a problem, not, not you know, the increased bony work required versus an ALIF, uh, but also the segmental issues. I, I, what, what do you think uh, with expandable cage technology, and you, you touched upon this, where it may improve uh, your segmental uh, correction more than, you know, static cages? Yeah, well, I think at least for the Cajun Zach's paper, part of it is also the banana design. Um, you know, since you increase floor doses, uh, but also in the other cases where um, you know you, you have a cage that will go in parallel, but then you can expand it up to like fifteen or twenty degrees. So. Um, you know, I just think that this is one area where the technology has definitely added uh, added some weapons in our arsenal to to address things. So, um, you know, maybe that you know, if you're doing a bunch of laterals and you don't want to do an A lift, that that L five S one T lift isn't doesn't look so bad. Um, so we, we keep Dr. Anon happy. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, um, any uh, questions at all? Because I, I think. Uh, uh, Neil Nan is actually going to give a demonstration on tubular T-lifts, which is ironic, actually, because he's such a component <laughs> of anterior surgery. But, uh, you know, to be an MIS surgeon, you have to be facile with multiple techniques, and I, I think we're going to highlight that. Obviously, you gave a talk uh, on T-lifts, but I know you do a lot of laterals and A-lifts, and uh, I think uh, in this day and age, a spine surgeon needs to be able to do every procedure and, you know, fit the uh, technique to the patient. Um, so. Um, is uh, Neil ready at all?